This video is about greenhouse management and will cover such topics as climate control, different size flats and trays, heat mats, filling trays, seeding trays, hardening off, and thinning. All right, welcome to our propagation houses. We got two of them here on site at New Entry. Um, this is our smaller one. Uh, both are heated with propane. You know, over here, this is our larger, um, this is our larger propagation house. Um, so in New England, you really have to heat with something. You need some form of additional heat um, if you're starting seeds in the spring. Um, folks typically start seeding uh, late February or early March. Um, and there are a number of options for heating your greenhouse. Some people use wood, some people use oil. Um, some people use um, propane, like us, uh, and yeah, so the, there are many options there. Um, and there are a couple important things to think about, uh, well, there are a lot of important things to think about when you're uh, running a greenhouse, but climate control is a big part of them. So we'll, we'll talk about that right now. So uh, ventilation and circulation are two different things that are both very important when you think about greenhouse um, activities. So ventilation is actually removing air from the greenhouse and circulating fresh air in from outside. So there are a couple ways to do that. There's passive, which would be just opening the doors or rolling up the sides. A lot of greenhouses are equipped with roll-up sides, which we can go look at. All of ours are down right now, but um, as, the summer, uh, as the summer comes and things warm up, we'll start rolling them up. Um, so right now we got our doors open. You can see our doors are open on this tunnel too. Um, you also have active ventilation, which would be a vent fan and louvers. So up here on the top, you see we have a, a louver with a vent fan. Oh, look, it's kicking on now. And this fan, when it kicks on, opens those louvers and pulls air through the greenhouse towards us, um, which is really important. Um, that's uh, controlled by a thermostat, so when the greenhouse gets to a certain temperature, it kicks on. Now, depending on what you're growing, you can set your temperature differently. Um, I typically like to keep greenhouses at, um, you know, it's about balancing. It's all about balance. Like, you can have an ideal range and then spend a lot of resources keeping it in that ideal range. So the wider you make your range, you know, the less you spend on propane or the less you spend on electricity um, venting. Um, but I typically set my thermostats at night at uh, 60 at a minimum. Some people might do a little lower, 55, anywhere in that range, but I like 60. Um, and I try not to let the greenhouse get warmer than 80 or 85. Um, and so if you have your doors open and sides rolled up and uh, some sort of uh, ventilation, uh, even on a hot day, you should be able to keep it down below that. Um, the other thing we should talk about is circulation, which is different from ventilation. So within the greenhouse, you want to make sure that the air is circulating around um, even when the vents aren't open or the doors are closed. So say it's a, a cloudy day and it's 50 or even colder and we don't want to open the doors because that's, that's too cold. We still want fans going inside, moving the air around. We don't want stagnant air. Um, that's how you get issues like uh, bacterial diseases, fungal diseases, um, even some insect pests. Um, so by having good circulation and ventilation, you can help to avoid that. So in here, we have just a fan on the floor. This is our small, smaller greenhouse, so um, it's kind of, you know, we have we have fewer resources here. This is our overflow essentially. If we look over here, this is our main prop house. We have two mounted circulation fans on the frame of the greenhouse, and they kind of circulate the air around. One's pushing, the one on the right is pushing towards the back, and the one on the left is pushing towards us. So it's always a circular motion. Um, and, and we find that that's really important for helping to limit um, issues in your greenhouse, disease, uh, fungal issues, insects, uh, and whatnot. Um, so that's kind of an overview of greenhouse temperature control, just one of many important uh, aspects to consider when you're running a greenhouse. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about seeding, specifically seedling flats and trays. So there are a million different options you can choose when you're thinking about what tray to use. There are different size trays, different types of trays, different materials. Some people don't even use trays, they use soil blocks. And then there's a whole other issue, not issue, concept of direct seeding, which is just seeding straight into the ground and not in a tray. So skipping the greenhouse altogether. So right now we're really gonna focus on um, plastic, black plastic 1020 flats. And they call them 1020s because they're 10 
by 20 inches or thereabouts. Um, and there's a couple broad types. So there's your celled flat. And there, these flats have all different sizes, numbers of cells. We'll talk about a few of those. You have your bottom flat or basket. This is typically used under the bottom of the flat. It kind of, these are a little flimsy. They break pretty easily. Um, so the bottom flat is a little more rigid or a little stronger, more flexible. So it helps support the trace so they last a little longer. And then we have open flats. So open flats are kind of the same material as the cell, as the cell trays, um, but they're not cells, they're just one big open trough, if you will. And they also fit in these bottom flats. These are pretty flimsy too, so the bottom flats are especially essential when you're using, um, when you're using these open flats just to make sure they don't just break on you immediately. Um, for the, so here at New Entry, we mostly use cell flats for, pro, for starting our seeds. Um, some people will use open flats for certain things, and they definitely have benefits. Um, like they, you know, you fill them with soil, they hold water for longer, which is nice. Um, and they are pretty cheap, they're easy to find, they're pretty common. Um, and yeah, um, and you can leave your seedlings in there for longer, that's a nice thing because there's so much room for the roots to, to explore around. Um, the cell flats are nice because they use less soil, that's a big one. So potting mix can be a pretty significant expense. So we like that the cell flats are more efficient with those. Um, and they're also equally pretty easy to find. Um, and they're really versatile in that you can get all different sizes. So this one we're looking at is a 50, it has 50 cells. Right here, this one's a 128. And this one's a 98. Those are some common sizes. 200s are also pretty common. Um, but I personally like to use um, 98s, 128s, and sometimes 50s for most of my things. 72s, I should also say, are a common size um, that are also really good for some things. And I know the numbers are kind of arbitrary, but so it goes. Um, so depending on what you're seeding, it will be better adapted for one type of tray or the other. So we're using these 50s for winter squash. All cucurbits tend to like bigger cell flats. Um, 128s are very commonly used for a lot of greens, lettuce, um, some brassicas, um, and 98s I like to use for bigger brassicas like cabbage or, um, or kale, even uh, broccoli, um, stuff like that. Uh, but by no means do you need to use any size tray for any particular thing. There's, there's not really that many limitations on what you can do. Like, you know, I wouldn't necessarily put uh, a cucurbit into a small cell 128 or 200 just because the cells are tiny. The cucurbit seeds are almost the same size as a cell of a 200, so that wouldn't be any good. Um, but there is a lot of versatility. You know, a lot of people will use kind of 128s across the board for a lot of stuff with the exception of cucurbits or um, nightshades like tomatoes, which like um, to have kind of uh, bigger cells. If we come over here, we can look at some other considerations when seeding, which can help think about what kind of tray you want to use or how many seeds per cell. So we have a couple seed packets here, and there's a, seed packets have an amazing amount of information on them. So kind of some of the stuff becomes second nature once you do it enough times, but uh, this one's just for spaghetti squash. Um, and there's, on the back of this seedling packet, it has all sorts of information. The seed specs, uh, the culture, so what kind of soil it likes, the pH. Um, if you're going to transplant it, if you're going to direct seed it, the spacing, common diseases, insect pests, like tons of information. So if you're seeding and you're like, oh, I don't remember something, check the seed packet. Depending on your seed company, there's a good chance there'll be useful information on it. Some really important information is typically uh, on a sticker or printed on it, which is the germination rate and the germination test date. So right here, circle, we have germ rate, germ 95%. That means 95% of the seeds will germinate. <laughs> um, germ test date is important too, because you could have a 100% germination rate, which would be great, but if it was germ tested five years ago, there's a good chance some of those seeds have lost their viability um, over that time, unless you stored them in perfect conditions, which um, a lot of people don't. Um, so germination rate can help you decide how many seeds per cell you want to do. Um, and typically, it's one seed per cell. Uh, when I'm seeding most things, certain things like if I'm if I'm transplanting beets, I want them in clusters. If I'm transplanting spinach, I will want a little cluster. 
Um, so I'll use multiple seeds per cell in those cases. Or if something has a really, really low germination rate, sometimes I'll use two. Um, like when you're seeding flowers, some flowers just inherently have really low germination rate. So it can be good to use two seeds per cell in some instances. But really, if you check that germination rate, that's going to tell you um, whether you should whether you should use two seeds per cell or maybe seed an extra flat um, would also be a good option. Um, and yeah, so that's kind of an overview of seedling trays, um, some information on the seed packets, which can help decide what tray you want to use um, and how many seeds per cell. Um, and yeah. Some crops prefer warmer temperatures to germinate. So for things like tomatoes, peppers, eggplant, a farmer might put them on a heat mat to get them going. In which case, one would seed them more densely in a tray like this, maybe a slotted tray. And then when the time comes, pot them up into bigger cells so that they can grow a bit longer in the greenhouse. This saves space on the heat mat, but then give, still gives the seedlings time to grow to their full size. Just wanted to talk real briefly about filling your trays. Uh, we've got our really good potting soil here. This is Vermont Compost Company's Fort V. It's a great blend, and I'll show you all the ingredients in this compost or in this potting soil, but I want to first just make sure there's no big clumps in my tub of soil here, just breaking up clods so that when I fill the trays, it's more loose. And if your potting soil is dry, you might want to wet it down. This has some good moisture in it, so I'm not adding any now, but if it is dry, it's good to add a little bit of water, get it so it's not dripping wet, but but damp. And when you fill the trays, you want the soil to be in them a little bit more densely than if you were to just kind of place it in there. So how I like to do that is I overfill the tray and I do just a little bit of drop a few times just to get the soil to uh, compact a little bit more so it's not so fluffy. Otherwise it might dry out a little quicker. And then the corners, since they didn't have as high a mound, they didn't get as much pressure on them, so I just push a little bit into the corner, wipe it off. The consistency I'm looking for after I pack the trays is almost like a dense cake, like a nice spongy cake. It's got plenty of good nutrients in there. It won't dry out too quick, but it's also not jammed in there so that the roots can still grow through that loose medium. That's filling trays. I wanted to talk briefly just about seeding your trays once you've filled them up and it's got that nice cake-like consistency. It's time to put the seeds in. And different seeds require different depths to be planted. Different seeds are different sizes. So this is a delicata squash seed. And there's a certain amount of energy in the seed that it uses to send up those seed leaves to break through and get sunlight, at which point it can be energized by the sun. So it only has so much energy to get out of the soil. So you want to plant it at the right depth. Um, oftentimes the seed pack will tell you, or the seed catalog, so this is suggesting planting seeding depth of a half inch to an inch out in the field. Um, some people say about two times the length of the seed is how much soil sh it should be covered with. So if this is, say, you know, a quarter inch, you cover it with a half inch of soil. So that's kind of a rule of thumb, but look at the seed pack when in doubt, or Google. Um, and then for making holes, people do it different ways. Some people will punch in a little dimple, plug in the seeds, throw a little soil on top at the end. But uh, one thing I like to do when I'm seeding trays just to make it go quicker is I'll kind of go in a circular motion and create these mounds around the, uh, you could do two fingers if three is too crazy, 
create these mounds around it so that I can just plant the seeds in there and when I'm done just cover them up and move on. But one last thing to remember is to label your trays. A tray that is unseeded looks exactly like a tray that is seeded and if you don't keep track of it you might bring an unseeded tray into the greenhouse, water it for a couple weeks only to find nothing happening and, uh, and your planning might be off a bit. So making sure you have your tags laid out for the number of trays you need is a good good way to make sure you you seed the right amount. So I want to talk briefly about hardening off your seedlings. When they're in the greenhouse, they're in kind of an ideal environment. They've got comfortable temperature, they've got regular water. Um, it's a very comfortable space for them. When they get transplanted out in the field, it's a dramatically different environment. They get put into new soil and the air is often colder, they're getting direct sunlight. So there are multiple kind of shocks that happen to a plant between the time of going from the greenhouse into the ground. Hardening off helps space out those shocks. You get the plant used to the colder air, the wind, they get a little strength as they deal with the wind and uh, you can water them a little less. So basically what hardening off is, is you take your plants out of the greenhouse, put them outside for a few days. You might water them a little bit less so they get used to not having just the perfect amount of water all the time. They get used to the, the new atmosphere, so then after a few days you put them in the ground, at which point they have to adjust to the new soil environment. So it's just kind of gradually introducing the plants to a, a new environment. And it helps, it helps reduce transplant shock. If you were to go just straight from the greenhouse into the ground, the, the transplants might get really shocked and it could stunt their growth. Uh, another concept I want to talk about too is um, thinning. So sometimes you might purposefully seed more than one seed per cell and then go back and thin. But things like beets and chard um, oftentimes will sprout more than one uh, little shoot. So if you only want one Swiss chard plant per cell as you go and plant out in the field, you might have to come through and thin your tray. So if, I don't know if you can see this one right here, you can see there's a couple little shoots coming out of this one cell. So I might pick the less healthy one, being careful not to disturb the one I want to keep, and just thin it out. You could keep this, put it on a salad at lunch, um, but that'll enable the one that you want to grow to really get the space it needs and then you can go transplant them out and have the amount you want rather than having to thin them in the field. This hardening off table, we have built hoops and we can put reme over. So if we're having an especially cold spring like we are this year, on the cold nights we'll put that reme over. So they're still getting adjusted to the new environment but just gradually introducing them, not shocking them too much. That's hardening off and thinning.